My name is Rachel Hogan Carr. I'm executive director here at Nurture Nature Center. Uh, a lot of you are uh, familiar with what we do here at Nurture Nature Center, but there are some who are here for the first time. And we do science, art, and dialogue programs and community programs like this about local environmental issues designed to build resiliency in the communities uh, where we are um, to hazards. And so this project is called Create Resilience. It is funded by NOAA's Office of Education. And it is a four-year project that we're working on in the communities in, within the Bangor, Wilson, and Easton area school district and all the municipalities therein. And we are working with high school students who are here. Well, our teen ambassadors raise your hand and create youth ambassadors. So you see these hands that are up here are part of, we're in the second year of the project. This is our second cohort of youth who are working with us uh, coming from Easton, Bangor, and Wilson area high schools. And we're really excited that we have this great dynamic group of young people who are going to help us in this year learn about hazard mitigation um, and ways that our communities here in that Bangor, Easton, Wilson, and greater Lehigh Valley can become more resilient to hazards in the future. We are working toward, in this project, building a community shared vision of what resilience would look like. What would Easton, what would Bangor, what would Portland, what would West Easton, what would Wilson, uh, what would Rosetto, what would all of Williams Township, what do these communities look like 10, 20, 30 years from now in a resilient future? How will it look when we've planned for stormwater, flooding, extreme heat, winter storms? How will our communities look in a resilient future? And to that end, we're going to be creating some visual murals um, in for the project in year three. Um, and so we have some artists who are working with us who are here. Uh, we have municipal leaders who are here also in the community right now um, who, are work who are here today, who are here to learn. So we've got a great mix and we've got residents who are really committed to the communities where they live. So this is a really neat uh, event we have here tonight. The format um, program is we're going to have three panelists speak and they're going to do short presentations, 10 minutes each. We're going to be pretty tight on the time clock um, to keep them going. Not exactly lightning talks, but still fast talks. And then the rest of the time is going to be for questions, for you all to ask the questions that you have of them. We'll stay in this room until about 7.30. At 7.30, we'll break from this room and we're going to move over to our Science on a Sphere Hall and we're going to have tables over there from local organizations, including the organizations our panelists represent as well as others. And when we close, I'll tell you a bit about more about that. Um, but you are going to be able to go over there and ask your questions one-on-one -on -one that you may have from our FEMA representative or our Northampton County Conservation District or the uh, Association, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, Penn State Ag Extension, Northampton County Conservation District, I think I said. Um, Northampton County Emergency Management Services is in the back of the room um, and they'll be there as well. And I'll tell you about what you can expect to get from each of those um, as well as from Penn State Ag Extension here. Um, from 7.30 to 8.30. And we have some food. Feel free to do that on your own. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Zane Hadzik. Zane is on the advisory board for our Create Resilience project, and he's an excellent member, and we're really happy to have brought him up here from Philadelphia today. He's the senior planning specialist in the floodplain management and insurance branch of FEMA's Region 3 office, which is the area that uh, covers our region here. He's the lead planner for the Commonwealth of Virginia, Washington, D.C., and the central region of Pennsylvania. He's responsible for helping communities protect people and property through floodplain management regulations, conducting compliance visits, providing technical assistance, reviewing floodplain regulations, interpreting flood maps and studies, which I've tried to do, no easy thing, and advocating for the purchase of flood insurance. During times of disaster, he serves as liaison officer in the field and in the regional response center. And sometimes we try to reach him and he's out in the field, he's been deployed responding immediately to an emergency response, um, and other times he gets to be in a planning role. So it's a pretty neat job and we should uh, learn more from what he does. Um, he holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science with a focus in soil, water, and land resources, and a master's degree from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in natural resources and the environment. Zane, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out. We have a great uh, turnout here for a Tuesday night. So I have so much that I want to say and I'm super excited about this topic. In my um, job description, I am a mitigation planner. So this is very near and dear to my heart. When I get enthusiastic, I might go a little fast and I have 10 minutes to cover which can be about two months worth of material. So. Bear with me. If you have questions, I apologize in advance, but I will be sitting at a table over there. So my strategy for this presentation is to inundate you with uh, plenty of information and then make myself available to follow up with questions and provide further clarity. So 
bear with me. But first and foremost, I want to start with what is mitigation. I never want to make the assumption that someone knows what it is. Um, simply put, it's the effort to reduce lo uh, loss of life and property by lessening the impacts. You need to know your risk, analyze that risk, reduce the risk, and insure against that risk. Insurance is a big part of what I do and a big part of what I will talk about tonight, which is why I have it up on this slide. And it really warms my heart to see everyone here tonight, right? Blue sky conditions. I mean, it's not blue sky now, but you get the point. It's nice. It's not disaster time. This is when we need to start planning for mitigation. So it's fantastic that we're all in the same room and we're talking about it. So mitigation matters, right? I have a ton of information on here. Again, all strategically done. I'm not going to read every word. I know I broke some presentation rules by putting this many words on a slide, but I will follow up. My contact information is going to be at the end, and I'm more than happy to provide this material to you. What I want to highlight on here is um, for every dollar we invest up front on mitigation for riverine flooding, specifically I'm pointing out riverine flooding because that's where I work most of the most of the time we save $7 or we see a $7 benefit from that. That is a really, really big value and adds up super quickly. So this graphic will be shared with you if you are interested in it. Risk management. We have our initial risk on the um, top left corner and residual risk in the bottom. And you can see that there's various stages, right? There's as soon as the risk occurs, we have to prioritize outreach. We have to make sure that our, struc our um, structures have built, been built to compliance, um, that we have a sound zoning or ordinance, and as you go down with residual risk, you'll see insurance is there through the NFIP, which stands for the National Flood Insurance Program. FEMA loves their acronyms. We have a book of acronyms about acronyms. So um, if I use an acronym and, an acronym and don't define it, cut me off, I will define it. Um, but you'll see insurance is the foundation here, and I think a lot of people fail to realize that, right? It, it is the closest thing that will make you whole after an event. People always want s assistance, and we're going to talk about w what money is available after an event. But um, insurance really is the answer. It's called the National Flood Insurance Program. I always say it's first and foremost about protecting people and property, but insurance is right there. Okay, so I said the NFIP. Some of you may not know what that is. It's the National Flood Insurance Program. It was created in 1968, and it's a voluntary program, right? Communities opt to join this, and by doing so, they get the benefits of getting flood insurance, access, access to grants and loans, disaster assistance, and like I said, we want to protect people and property. That is our goal with the program. Up here, you see the term base flood. We call that, um, sometimes we'll refer to it as BFE. I want you to think of that as how high water is going to rise when there's a 1% annual chance flood. Not a 100-year flood. We used to say that all the time, and people would say, oh, I had the 100-year flood. I'm good for 100 years. doesn't work that way. Um, so we call it the 1% annual chance flood. That's our segue into the special flood hazard area and flood zones. And I'm not going to go into that, even though I really want to. But I'm going to be at a table, and I'm going to have my computer in front of me. And you could come ask me any question. We could put in your address, and I could show you where your property is in relation to a flood zone. Just because you're not in a flood zone doesn't mean you're not at risk. And what it actually means is you still should get insurance, and it's at a more aff affordable rate. Um, some very basics on flood insurance. Um, it's sold by um, licensed property and casualty insurance agents. You could go directly through FEMA or write your own service. Um, essential elements of the rating include, so when they're coming up with your flood insurance rating, they look at your flood zone and they look at the difference between the base flood elevation, remember how high that water is going to come during the 1% annual chance flood, and your lowest floor elevation. And they also look at building occupancy and type. And then we have a little graph here on our right-hand side showing um, how much you could get for residential, non-residential, and uh, other residential structures, which we could talk in more detail later. I but I, don't, I can't fit in in the 10 minutes. Um, also, there's something called the increased cost of compliance. Um, this is another funding source to help people after an event, right? And what it could do is it could provide up to $30,000 for mitigation efforts. And that is directly related to the acronym we like to call FRED. For flood proofing, that's only non-residential structures, relocation of a structure, elevating that structure, or demolishing that structure. So remember FRED. 
or ICC. Okay, so what other opportunities might be available for accessing money to take mitigation action? We have something called a hazard mitigation grant pr program, as you see in the top left. We have a pre-disaster mitigation program and we, had a f we have a flood mitigation assistance program. HMGP is only after a major declaration for a disaster has been declared. Pre-disaster is before the actual event occurs. And these are all ways that a community can get access to funds for helping with mitigation efforts. And then there's also the flood mitigation assistance, which directly targets um, repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss properties and substantially damaged structures, all of which we could talk in more detail at my table, where I'll be sitting with a giant smile on my face, welcoming you. Okay, other possible funding sources. I borrowed this from Pima, the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. Again, I will share this um, PowerPoint slide with you so you have access to these grants. Tom Hughes is um, your state hazard mitigation officer, and these are links that he provided when him and I did a joint presentation on additional resources av available. So we could talk in more depth with this, and I could also um, introduce you to Tom if you don't know him already. Okay, another topic. This feels a little disjointed, I promise. it's. It's all cohesive and together, um, but there's many components in the National Flood Insurance Program and mitigation, but a big talk, topic is substantial damage. And something we're doing at the region and something that I've been working on recently is this administrative procedure where FEMA comes out to a local community that's interested and we establish a working relationship to collaboratively work on a workshop where we come up with a strategic plan for how we are going to capture substantially damaged structures when an event occurs. Substantial damage is a really big deal. Essentially what it means is, is if a structure is damaged and the cost to repair it is greater than or equal to 50% of the fair market value of just that structure, it's deemed substantially damaged and it's treated like a new structure. So what that means is they may have to elevate their house, they may have to drive flood proof it if it's non-residential, and communities are sometimes blindsided by this in the, um, after a big event. So what we do, blue sky conditions, we go out ahead of time and we make a plan for how they're going to do that. One other thing related to this is the community rating system. Again, um, this is another component of many things we could talk about. The community rating system is a uh, incentive-based program, it's voluntary, that a community who is taking mitigation action and efforts to increase their resiliency, like many of us and the municipalities in this room are doing, can be rewarded. And it's a financial incentive, and it's really a win-win-win for everyone. It's, it looks good for the community, it looks good for the community um, leader, it protects people and property, it saves folks money, and it makes FEMA and the state happy as well because we're protecting people and property. And essentially what this program is, is you get a giant booklet and it says what you need to do or capture what you're doing and it assigns points to all the mitigation actions you're taking. And those points get added together and depending on how many points you get, you fall into different class rating. The lower you go in the class rating, the bigger the discount. So a class one would save 45% on their flood insurance if they're in the special flood hazard area, which is a tremendous savings. I will say a class one is extraordinarily hard to get. Um, we see a lot of communities in this um, five through five through nine uh, class ranking system. So um, I've personally gone through this myself. I could talk to you in more detail about that if you're interested. Sorry for the whirlwind. I said I talk fast when I'm passionate about something. Um, I really like mitigation, and it sounds like we're going to be doing questions and answers later. So, yep, I'll let that up on the screen. Phone number, email. If you want the the slide deck, please, please, please email me. Um, as Ra Rachel said, I'm not always um, in the office, so email is the best way to get me. I, I travel a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.
our, our next guest is also wonderful um, and, and a good friend of Nurture Nature Center. Rebecca Kennedy is a water resource scientist who first engaged in environmental conservation as a volunteer in her teens. She has 40 years of experience as a professional and as a volunteer in natural resource conservation science and community engagement. She serves as president of the Watershed Coalition of the Lehigh Valley, which also has a table out in the other room and you can learn more about their work, uh, and resides in Percocet, Pennsylvania in Bucks County. And she's going to give us a presentation about some of the work that she has done, uh, other ways to deal with hazards of a completely different sort. So thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm actually uh, probably as a, a nice relief, I took the exact opposite. <laughs> as Zane did, and what I put, did was I just put together a couple of slides with some pictures, figuring that I was just going to show some examples of the type of work that has been done here in the Lehigh Valley on a scale that is reachable by homeowners or municipalities with materials that you have laying around, like your public works department if you're a municipality, uh, small grant funding, um, you know, nothing really a larger scale than people could imagine on their own property or municipal property. Um, so I'm just going to show some examples of some backyard, park, and municipal office greening projects that the Watershed Coalition has been involved with over the last couple of years. We, we are also involved in larger scale projects, uh, the, the ones that are of a, a larger financial and, and resource scale, but I, I didn't want to highlight those this evening because that wasn't the audience um, that you know is here this evening. So we're uh, we've done rain gardens, riparian buffers, vegetated swales, pollinator gardens. Uh, we've done some lawn to meadow conversion, green roofs, invasive plant control, and a lot of outreach and education. Um, invasive plant removal is really uh, kind of a, an un, an unsung and really challenging issue for any project that involves vegetation. And uh, largely, volunteers are very effective and can really help to create and then maintain the integrity of a, a native vegetative system. Nobody really wants to uh, naturalize an area and then end up with a great crop of Japanese hops, not weed, still grass. So that step is really important, and uh, volunteers and community members can be really effective in helping to achieve uh, invasive plant control, and a lot of folks find it really satisfying. Uh, we had a great program that's ongoing where we have volunteers who take machetes over at Jacobsburg um, and then eat ice cream afterwards, and we've gotten a lot of requests to do that program again. We do a lot of outreach and education. Um, as this event demonstrates, just getting conversations started with your neighbors and in your community can really be the first step to making people aware that there is a problem, what types of solutions exist, and uh, people often need to hear about things from different angles and in different places before it becomes part of their knowledge base. So we do outreach and education at community events, uh, we, uh, we do events like this, and then larger scale conferences as well to provide people with a number of different opportunities to, to learn, and, and we aim it towards different age groups. Um, we do a lot of demonstration projects where we will take on a greening project, like a small riparian buffer or a, a rain garden planting, and then work with community members and interested volunteers to get people on the ground and kind of doing whatever the activity is so that they have a sense of what they can do on their own property or, or how they can take that knowledge back into their communities. The Watershed Coalition um, has a little bit of a thing going on with municipal office rain gardens. Um, I think we're up to close to a dozen municipal buildings in the Lehigh Valley have rain gardens that we've put in. Most of these we've worked collaboratively with the Municipal Public Works Department. Um, a couple of them have actually been done uh, by hand by volunteers. This one is one that we put in at Plainfield Township. This is right after it was planted, so it hasn't had a chance to really come into its own. Um, we've done uh, uh, gardens all around Bushkill Township, uh, their municipal buildings. 
Um, and we've done some great gardens at the Upper Saucon Township Authority, and uh, we have uh, gardens also at the Upper, Upper Saucon Township Building as well. Rain gardens at municipal buildings can be a great outreach, uh, particularly where uh, uh, attendees at the municipal meetings have to pass by the practices on their way to engage with their community. And we have signs at almost all of these explaining um, what they do and how they function and how they're built and uh, provide contact information for people who would like to put practices like this uh, in their backyards. Um, this is kind of one from start to finish at, uh, at Penn Argyll. And I think the ones at Plainfield and Bushkill and Penn Argyll are probably close enough to the communities that are in this room that you could go take a look at them. Although I have to say, they're probably not gonna show their best faces in November. So I would say, Go out in August and really take a look. Um, we've kind of done some things that are a little bit uh, further out there. We have a, we've done a couple of green roof projects. Um, and those have actually proved to be really challenging. We kind of went into those with this uh, enthusiasm and optimism that we would just be able to retrofit existing green roofs. But a number of our volunteers are inconveniently and irritatingly uh, structural and mechanical engineers um, who really, you know, at varying uh, levels of gentleness have disabused us of the idea that you can just put, you know, enormous quantities of soil and water on top of existing structures and have forced us against our will to shore up you know, the, the structures of the roofs. But we have, we have put a couple in place and uh, are kind of working on uh, finding strategies to, to, you know, do green roofs in a way that, you know, will keep the structural and mechanical engineers off our backs, to be honest. Are there any, in there is, well, no. <laughs> Jeff, you're a civil engineer, so. Hopefully there's no structural and mechanical engineers in the room. Um, so this one is at uh, Camel's Hump Farm, and then we put together uh, a tabletop uh, demonstration as well that we can we can take and, and talk to folks about green roofs. We have done uh, countless rain barrel workshops. The the watershed community in the Lehigh Valley uh, has really embraced drilling holes in uh, uh, Coca Cola syrup containers and putting <laughs> fittings in and. Uh, the community members throughout the Lehigh Valley have really demonstrated a, a taste for taking these home. So I would say we probably put on maybe about, uh, you know, five to 12 of these a year and have now for over a decade, and they continue to be successful. The Watershed Coalition generally will coordinate with uh, the local watershed associations to put these on. So these are a couple examples um, over the past. And at most of these rain barrel workshops, there's an educational component. So while folks are getting ready to, you know, do the, the construction of them, we'll have a, somebody address them and talk to them about uh, stormwater and flooding and how little things like uh, rain barrels can really make a difference. Another uh, practice that's, that's been more of a struggle than we had anticipated are uh, doing lawn to meadow conversions. Uh, it seems simple enough on the face of it that you would simply, you know, plow up or disc up or, you know, uh, use herbicide to kill existing lawn grass and then replace it with native full height vegetation. But it's proved to be really challenging because most of the area that's in lawn, not all, but most of it was once agricultural. And so there's a really significant uh, bed of invasive plant weed seeds in most of our soils. And so we've worked on a number of lawn uh, to meadow conversions throughout the valley, trying to find practices that are practical for people in their backyards. And we've settled on a couple of different strategies that would depend upon what your property is like and whether it was previously a farm. But we do have a number of resources to help folks who are interested in that. and. Given that lawn is not as impervious as a road, but it certainly does not absorb anywhere near as much flood water and storm water as a full height meadow does, it's really a, a very quick way to take lawn areas that aren't really serving any purpose, which in 
true disclosure in, in my personal view is every lawn anywhere. But I understand that you know other people's <laughs> mileage may vary in that regard, um, and you know, and, and help it, uh, you know, absorb flood waters and also provide habitat. Um, I'm just demonstrating this project, showing about uh, talking about a little. This is a larger scale project that was done at Fry's Run County Park. Um, there's a lot of stream banks that look like this throughout the Lehigh Valley, and in fact, throughout the the Northeast. Um, Increased development has produced higher peak stormwater runoffs that uh, produce erosive pressure on our stream banks. And uh, so this project and a number of others that we have done take these stream banks and lay them back, create a, a more gentle slope, and try to stabilize them uh, with vegetation. So that's what this project uh, looked like during its construction. That's Jim Wilson of Northampton County Parks. Um, working on the, the left-hand side. And uh, that's what this project looks like now. There's, a, there's trees and full height native vegetation now on both sides of the stream. Um, and this is just really a couple years after uh, it's been established. So uh, one last thought uh, is, you know, for people working within individual communities uh, and whether you're a citizen or a municipal decision maker, um, there's a lot of uh, complicated uh, programs and regulatory structures you can work with, um, and those are all extremely important. Um, but there's also really some simple things that you can either do yourself, depending on whether you're a resident or you can encourage residents to do, if you're a municipal decision maker or in that kind of, of a role. Um, and that, you know, just some simple steps to retain and protect existing natural areas. Um, en encouraging the retention of existed, uh, existing forested areas, which can be done uh, by municipalities in any number of ways through the, the land development process. Uh, and likewise, protecting meadows. Um, there has been a, a number of projects that I've seen coming up in the Lehigh Valley recently where uh, what I'm going to call pocket wetlands, small wet areas that are persistently wet in parks or on municipal property uh, are being converted to their actual wetland use instead of people continuing to struggle to try to drain them. Um, a co longtime colleague of mine uh, discovered this uh, in one of her college textbooks and repeats it endlessly that wetlands are the, the kidneys of the landscape and they really provide uh, the opportunity to store and retain, soak up and filter stormwater. So, so they're your friends and if you have a capacity, if you work in a capacity or are a homeowner and have these persistent wet areas that you're trying to deal with, um, you know, if nature's giving you lemons, then make lemonade. Um, there's a lot of really cool wetland plants out there, um, and some of them are carnivorous, and there's some native carnivorous wetland plants. So if you're both a plant geek and you have a piece of wet property you'd like to deal with, uh, pitcher plants and uh, Venus flytraps, there are native species of all of those, so that could be a really fun project. Um, and then uh, lastly, the Watershed Coalition Lehigh Valley, uh, seven years ago, collaboratively with Penn State Extension, created a volunteer training program, uh, which is now going to be, by the end of 2020, I think in 22 counties throughout the state, but it uh, began here in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, citizens who have an interest in learning more and engaging in their communities can go through a training program. It's about I don't know, 40 to 50 hours of training here in the Lehigh Valley will start in March and finish in, in early June. And then uh, be paired with ongoing opportunities to engage in your community with other like-minded people. Um, the program also has really good food, so I can, I can recommend that. So there's evening classes and then weekends. So those are some opportunities for, for folks to engage. And for the, the I, their high school, Ambassadors. So for the high school ambassadors in the class, any of you who are 18 are welcome to train and become members. But we've actually had, I'm going to say, just in the classes that I've been involved with in about four counties, we've had about a dozen pairs 
of parents and, uh, and high school students go through the program and really, really enjoy it. So this could be your opportunity to Shanghai your parents mm -hmm. into also engaging in conservation if it's an interest in yours, of yours. So that's it. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Yeah. Okay, our final presentation, and hopefully you all are uh, jotting down your questions. Um, our final presentation is Sharon Pletchen, who is the district manager of the Northampton County Conservation District. She's been with the district for more than 13 years, beginning her career in the Chapter 102 Erosion and Sedimentation Control Program. She has her BS in Biology from Kutztown University and MA in Biology from Villanova University. And as manager of the district, and this is why she's here with us today, she oversees seven environmental programs. Um, including topics on erosion and sedimentation, stormwater management, um, agricultural assistance, watershed management, dirt gravel and low volume roads, spotted lanternfly, nutrient manure management, and education outreach. And when she's not doing all that, she gets <laughs> out um, and spends time with her dog. She does yoga, plays volleyball for various local league, uh, leagues, and recently has been working more closely with the municipalities of Northampton County to coordinate MS4. For the municipal leaders here, you know what that means um, for stormwater efforts and to provide required continuing education for the program. She looks forward to continuing to build these local relationships to solve more regional environmental issues and see improvements in our local watersheds. And we're gonna hear about the work that her organization does, which is different from Zane and different from Rebecca and yet all part tied together to be part of the solution. You start it for me? Thank you. Yep. <laughs> so my presentation is quite simple. Um, what I wanna go through is the different programs that the, that the Northampton County Conservation District does. Um, Northampton County Conservation District was created back in 1961. We're actually a pretty old conservation district. Um, the, uh, the community of Northampton County was uh, interested in making uh, the county itself a conservation district. We serve both the agriculture and the urban interests. Um, we have a volunteer board of directors. Um, there's seven uh, directors. We also have associate directors. There's information at my table. If you're interested in becoming an associate director, you don't necessarily get to vote, but you get to come to all of our meetings and get to add to the conversation. So it's a definite great opportunity for you guys. Um, we are a political subdivision of the Commonwealth as well as a division of the county, so we are under the county government. Um, but we have various partnerships with state organizations um, as well as uh, county programs as well. But we operate under the belief that conservation works best um, locally. So when the people are in the environment um, and see the issues, bring it from a, a local perspective um, of how to create and manage um, uh, manage the resources. So these are the, so these the programs are um, that Rachel was uh, rattling off for you there. My start was in the top one there. So the chapter 102 program, which is erosion and sedimentation control, as well as stormwater management. Um, now I know Zane had gone through some, some acronyms. I do the same and I apologize. <laughs> but so the NPDES program, National Pollution Elimination Discharge System, or Discharge Elimination System, that is actually an EPA permit. It's federally mandated for any earth disturbance activity that's greater than one acre. Um, that's where I got my start back in 2006, where I'd be reviewing uh, plans uh, for construction. As you know, we're very busy in the Lehigh Valley. Um, we got the start uh, at our conservation district just looking at during construction. So erosion and sedimentation control, keeping the mud on the construction sites out of our resources. The other piece of that permit though, and more in line with what we're discussing tonight, is stormwater management. So long term, Yes, we're putting in a, uh, a new shopping plaza, but how do we mitigate for the impacts of that impervious surface? So, and that, it's actually a federal mandated program that, y that they come up with that plan before they get started. And we get to review that and, and um, work with the engineers to, to come up with a good solution. So we also have agricultural assistance program. Um, which is similar, it's still under Chapter 102, so the PA Code Regulation Chapter 102 is what I'm referring to. Um, but there is earth disturbance related to farming activity, plowing and tilling. Uh, we, the farmers have a little bit of a different interest when it comes to um, the uh, natural resource protection. One of their main natural resources is our topsoil. They wanna keep the topsoil where it is so they can grow what they need to grow. 
Um, this program is fairly new to our conservation district. We finally, this year, we have a full-time um, agricultural specialist who um, is very busy <laughs> immediately. Um, so, but that program is growing. We also have nutrient management um, and manure management, um, which if there's any type of animals on a, on, on a particular agricultural operation, there is requirements under regulations for them as well to make sure that their manure stays out of the natural um, resources of the county. Um, watershed management um, is in line with uh, what, what would rec Becca was talking to you about. Um, and actually, our watershed specialist um, works directly with Rebecca. Um, he sits on the board, um, and he's also on basically almost all the boards of the local watershed groups. So he is intertwined with all of the, the local groups. Uh, we have what started as a really small program and has definitely gotten larger is the Dirt, Gravel, and Low Volume Road program. Um, so a lot of municipalities own these older roads that there's not a lot of people on them. There's still dirt or gravel, and the people like it that way. But they're kind of low in the totem pole to getting maintained. Um, so this money is actually set aside uh, by the state and provided to conservation districts to grant out to municipalities, um, to those roads that actually have an impact to the, um, the natural resources. A lot of these roads are near flood areas and they're, they're lower populated areas. They added to the program in 2014 low volume roads so they can actually be paved. But again, low on the totem pole for municipalities to maintain and we can assist them. And really it's not necessarily repaving or resurfacing the roads. What we're trying to do is solve the drainage issues, the larger issues, why it becomes a maintenance nightmare to actually have these roads. Um, so it's, it's a way of using our background um, to assist municipalities and any road owning agency. We actually worked with the county last year for the first time. So, um, so we actually, our newest program is Spotted Lantern Fly Control. So you'll see it's not at my table, but of course I can ask questions, but I'm right next to the Spotted Lantern Fly table. Um, but I will explain a little bit further um, what we're doing with uh, that invasive species in particular. Um, but again, conservation districts are that resource for the state um, to offer programs and those counties that are interested in, in getting more involved with those programs, if you're a conservation district, you have that ability. Um, and then lastly, um, education outreach. Things like what we're doing right now. Um, one of my main focuses for education and outreach right now is the MS4 program, which I'll get into a little bit later too. So just to show you some pictures of the different programs that I just explained here. So this is um, the Chapter 102 program. It's actually covered by that. So Chapter 102, the program objectives here are to perform plan um, and permit reviews. Um, so a lot of paperwork, unfortunately. Um, and what we also do is once we do approve those plans, we go out and inspect to make sure that they're being implemented. Um, we respond to complaints. Uh, we also um, respond to uh, concerns of a particular municipality um, if something isn't necessarily working the way they expected. And we do have the ability to enforce. So there's different delegation agreements with the state. We have the highest delegation, so we have the ability to assess penalties uh, for violations of their permits. So the two scenarios that you see here, um, so this one right here, so this is a standard BMP that you probably have seen. BMP stands for best management practice, not perfect management practice. Um, but we do have earth disturbance here, and we're trying to keep this swale here as clean as possible. So when it rains on this surface here, this acts like a filter, and you're not gonna have muddy water going through this channel. But you can also see here that there is another backup BMP to make sure that we're not sending muddy water to our streams, which eventually this outlet structure will go to. So any inlets, things like that, catch basins that you see in the road, most of them in Pennsylvania, they don't go to a treatment facility. A lot of people think they do. They go directly to our streams. So sediment is actually our number one pollutant um, in Pennsylvania. It carries a lot of stuff with it, aside from itself causing impacts to the aquatic organisms that live there and then the ecosystem thereof. So it's an important program. Um, this, uh, 
This one down here, this is a gigantic sediment basin. So a lot of larger construction sites rely on larger BMPs like this because there's just too much drainage coming down. So we can't rely on these little fences. They're not gonna stand up to, to, to what is actually happening. So this is one of the larger ones that we've had and this is in Lower Nazareth, I believe. So the positive impact, so um, this is uh, what you could see <laughs> in comparison to what we want to see. Um, so obviously protecting the waterways, um, educating the public in that why is this such a bad thing? There's dirt in the stream already. What's the big deal? Well, there is a lot of adverse impacts um, to allowing this happening. Aside from the aquatic organisms, what we were talking about here earlier too is flooding. You fill the stream with, with sediment, now you're gonna have to dredge that out. That costs a lot of money. Um, it, it's better spent dollars to, to uh, stop the problem from happening as opposed to fixing it later on. So agricultural nutrient management. We work closely with NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, actually, we have a grant through them as well that our new position this year is working directly with them two days a week. Um, and he is helping to develop conservation plans or agricultural erosion and sedimentation control plans for farmers. A lot of the plans are outdated. Um, they've changed what they are growing, how they are growing it. Maybe they brought in animals, maybe they got rid of their animals. So they need to update those plans. Um, it's been passed down from generation to generation. So we're trying to get everybody up to speed here. Um, but the idea is the same, is to minimize soil loss. Um, and a lot of this scenario that you see in farm fields shouldn't be there. <laughs> so this should be corrected to be some type of greenway, um, or maybe we need to divert that water so the farmer can have the ability to, to, uh, to grow the crops that's needed. So here's an example of some of nutrient management concerns. In uh, Northampton County, we have a lot of horse farms, um, so there is a lot of manure generated from there. Where is it going? Where is it coming from? Um, we also have concerns, so, uh, and also like on, on farm areas, where do we store the manure? We wanna make sure that it's in the proper location, that it's not infiltrating into the ground or running off into, into streams or other people's properties. And then also, a lot of farms have streams and waterways going through them. Animals need access to water, but we shouldn't give them the entire way to uh, roam um, or we're gonna have the impacts to the waterways as well. So giving them a place to actually cross the stream um, where it's protected. So watershed management, I won't touch on this too much because Rebecca focused on this, um, but like I said, we provide technical assistance to um, all the, the watershed groups. Here are the, all the watershed groups in Northampton County were very well represented, um, as well as the coalition, um, bringing, bringing these, all, these guys all together. Um, what this program does is we, we do have one person in this program, but he uh, attends all of these meetings. He interacts with the municipalities. He's also very involved with education and outreach. He writes a lot of grants. There's a lot of grants where they're only available to conservation districts. So we have the ability to open that opportunity up to those that are interested. So we're also hoping to grow our uh, stream monitoring program. Uh, a lot of that is also with the, um, the watershed groups. We wanna make sure that we're not repeating efforts. So that's why we try to stay as close with those groups as possible. Um, but we do hope to have the equipment to then provide to, to the uh, watershed groups. So the dirt, gravel, and low volume road program, um, um, this was actually one of our most recent pro, uh, projects. This is in Moore Township, which is uh, not necessarily in this demographic area, but this is an example of something where this road was closed. Um, this was a very unsafe situation. They wouldn't allow people to even drive across it. So we had residences on both sides that were very inconvenienced. The road was closed for quite some time. Um, the money uh, was not available because again, this was a very low volume road it was actually partially dirt and gravel and partially low volume. Um, but what we did is we put in this uh, large structure. This was a fairly, it was like $244,000 project. Um, but uh, so Moore Township was uh, 
very grateful for being able to push this forward. Um, and they worked actually under an emergency permit um, for, from DEP um, to be in the stream, working in the stream. So we assisted with start to finish that process. So Spotted Lanternfly, um, you'll get some more information over at the tables, but our focus for Spotted Lanternfly right now is the control for the Elanthus tree. Um, so the tree of heaven, uh, we are provided uh, funds from the state to focus on removal and control of the species by using this tree. Uh, so you'll learn more about it, but the insect needs to feed on this tree. So this is a good target if we can put insecticides into this tree and actually have the insect feed on it, they will immediately die. So we were using it as a, as a trap method, um, and you can learn a lot more about that if you're interested over at the tables. Um, but what we also do is uh, we're doing uh, banding, so you'll see bands um, around some of the trees. This is actually a really large Elanthus tree that in a county park that we banded. Um, we trained a whole bunch of people to do that as well. Um, and it's also important to know each stage of the insect as well. So again, you'll learn a lot more about that. So and then education and outreach. Um, so invasive species removal, this is actually uh, your teachers at work. Um, I think Bangers represented here. Banger heavily attends our teacher workshops. Um, so, uh, but we bring our teachers together, we give them continuing education credits, and we also provide them with um, supplies that they can bring back to the classrooms for you guys. Um, so this is another example of, uh, of a teacher workshop where we uh, looked at Lehigh Valley geology. Um, and we also have the Envirothon, which some of you might be familiar with. So we run the Envirothon for Northampton County. That event, whoever wins the local event, gets to go to the state event. Um, so we very much enjoy that program. Again, Bangor is leading the way for, so somebody needs to come up and battle Bangor. They're doing very well, and they do very well out at states as well. So you'll see some more pictures on our display from that. So um, we also have summer internship program. Um, so we actually had um, our interns out there with the public at events like this, um, giving uh, talks and um, integrating with the, with the community. You got it. OK. Well, actually, look at that. We share a picture. Uh, <laughs> so we also assist with um, the rain barrel workshops and things like that. So now MS4 assistance, um, what I'm trying to do is uh, we've had, I guess, six this year so far as MS4 roundtables for the municipalities. Um, so bringing them together to talk about uh, their struggles with this new program. Uh, most municipalities had an MS4 permit, so a municipal separate storm sewer system permit. So very similar to the first program that I talked about, municipalities also have discharges to streams. And in order to keep those discharges, they have to make sure that they're not impacting and not sending pollution, whether it be sediment or used oil or fertilizers. They need to be mindful of where those discharges are. And then if something happens, they need to be able to trace it back and solve the problem. Um, it is a permit through the EPA, again. Um, and it, they are required to do projects that will better their, uh, in particular, uh, the, their area, in particular, their urbanized area, so the more city-type areas. So aside from offering these roundtables for municipalities to come together and, and talk, um, they also um, are entering into uh, MOUs, so Memorandum of Understandings. What's really nice about that document is we have the ability to say, this is what we're going to do up to this point, and here's when you take the baton and run from there. Um, and then we do also have the opportunity to work with them to get grant funding and things like that to move these projects forward because, again, same problem. There is there's no funding, so we got to figure it out. Um, our dirt and gravel and low volume road program is also a very useful tool for them. So keeping that these kind of meetings together to show what we can do to assist is really Working relationships are very important. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody knows that we're here, why we're here, and what programs we have to offer. So I talked about that. So here's our district staff. You can pick up anybody's card. I have them all at the, at the front desk or at our table there. So feel free to grab anybody that you're interested in.
and there's my contact information. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be here. We'll have some time here for um, group questions, and then we'll move over in a few minutes over to the other room where we can have one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, but if you have uh, burning questions of our panelists that you think are probably of the kind that are of interest to the whole audience, um, this would be the time to do it. If you have specific to your property and your specific thing, then we could probably do those when we go over for the one-on-one -on -one time. Um, but I have a traveling microphone. I think I have a, I have a traveling microphone. Uh, so does anyone uh, want to start questions? David, and you, you can introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Jaden. I'm student. I'm one of the student ambassadors. Um, do you guys worry about um, fracking or natural gas encroachment, worrying messing up the stability of water? So that's a great question. Um, we do, uh, we are involved very heavily. I don't know if uh, you're interested in a particular project, but um, the Penny's pipeline that's coming through, very large mm -hmm. um, pipeline project. Uh, we are reviewing the erosion and sedimentation control associated with that project. It runs completely across our county. Um, and actually all of our staff focuses on that plan. They're actually reviewing it right now. Um, so it is part of the planning process. As long as it meets the regulations, we do have to uh, allow that plan to be approved. Um, however, there is stormwater mitigation associated with that as well. They're getting a permit just like anyone else, um, and they are monitored and, and inspected. Um, but yes, it is definitely a concern, and we do treat it very seriously. I, I think to answer your direct question, there is no fracking going on here in the Lehigh Valley. Um, just right here, there's fracking north of us, but it isn't happening here in Lehigh Valley. So for those of us who are focusing on water quality in the two-county area, um, there's no reason for us to be concerned about it a as something that's happening in the Lehigh Valley. In other places, there's certainly reason for concern, but there's no fracking here. I will keep mine super short. If it's in the special flood hazard area, we definitely have a concern, yeah. right? We all, all development in the special flood hazard area needs to be permitted and proper review and um, permitting needs to take place. So if racking were to take place in the special flood hazard area or fall within some sort of environmental and historic preservation review, it would need to be permitted. And depending on what flood zone it is and its exact proximity, there are um, additional hoops that they would have to go through. Um, I have two questions, uh, but first I just wanted to uh, address the, uh, the fracking issue because there is a massive pipeline going to be coming down through these several counties and near Easton, which is going to impact watersheds uh, quite significantly by the size of the, the clearing of the landscape that they're going to be doing all the way through um, right out to our edge of our own park here at Two Mills Park. Just to bring that to a point. Um, but two questions. Uh, the what is your response to the reduction of the U.S. waters uh, by the U uh, current administration? Apparently, the tributaries are not going to be covered under U.S. Waters Act now. And also, commercial stormwater runoff uh, in uh, the large uh, warehouses. I understand we're going to be have a tax on stormwater runoff now in our urban areas um, in terms of uh, recently we were uh, told that I think by our city council and mayor and how that's going to impact the commercial uh, ventures that are uh, occurring in the area too. So. Anyone have somewhere they want to start with that one? Nope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming you live in the city of Easton? Uh, yes, I do live in the city of Easton. Okay. So the city of Easton, so uh, the MS4 programs and the MS4 permits been pushing stormwater fees. There is uh, minimal state funding available um, to support the program. So a lot of municipalities are implementing their own stormwater fee based on the amount of impervious surface that you own. So the warehouses and things like that pay a higher fee than everyone else because they have more impervious surface, more rooftop, more driveway. 
Um, so far, the city of Easton is the only municipality in, in Northampton County that has implemented the fee. However, based on the interest in the roundtable meetings I've been to, a lot of other municipalities are interested in the same thing. Um, so most likely there's going to be something to do with stormwater fees, um, not necessarily taxes, because it is going to be based on what you're going to do on your property as well. So um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rebecca, because the, the items that she was talking about, the implementation for property owners is really important. Because with those programs, you have the ability to reduce your fees by implementing things like rain gardens and things like that. It, no, it's it's purpose. It's so set up. Sole it is purpose. set sole purpose. Yep. So one really important feature of a stormwater fee um, is that it's equitable. So every municipality has quite a few. Some municipalities more than others of tax exempt properties. So churches and schools and other properties that don't pay taxes, but may have a lot of impervious area are essentially relying upon the rest of the tax paying base of that municipality to pay for fees and costs that the municipality incurs in dealing with their stormwater. So a stormwater fee, it is not a tax, is a much more equitable way for communities to fairly distribute the financial burden that they incur in dealing with, uh, in dealing with stormwater costs. I, I, other than the struggle uh, of changing and putting a new regulation in place, I really don't see any downside to them because they really enable municipalities to take on a, a difficult problem and solve it in an equitable way. Um, just quickly answering your question about the, the federal uh, regulatory situation, I'm in my 50s. I've been working in clean water since my teens. And my view about all of these things is it's not over until the fat lady sings. Uh, there is no regulatory change that's going to be proposed that will actually be fully implemented in whatever way it's being proposed and discussed now after it's worked its way through the various uh, executive agencies and the courts. So I, I generally will only comment on things that have already happened not things that are being proposed. We have a, a lot of very strong environmental advocates uh, in the, you know, locally and in the state and the country. Um, so I, I, won't, I don't see a lot of profit in speculating. That's just me. I, I don't think I'll add too much value at this point based on what my topic was on. So I, in, in the sake of time, I'll take on another question. Yeah. I thought I saw a hand. In, in your presentation, you mentioned prevention being a much better, uh, one to seven, I think, was the ratio. Uh, how committed is FEMA to mitigating the impacts of climate change with that uh, ratio in mind? <laughs> I am not FEMA. I am Zane Hadzik. Um, I will say that we focus on resi resiliency. So while we may not directly, specifically use the words climate change and adapting to climate change and mitigating for climate change, I can assure you that my colleagues and I um, have it in our mind for an improving resiliency. With that said, um, all of our flood maps that I'm gonna pull up that you look at with me are all based on past historical events. They do not take into consideration any future scenarios. I see sh shaking heads. I understand where you're coming from. Um, and they don't even take in, so they don't take into consideration future scenarios or models of the future. However, the community rating system that I um, mentioned for s encouraging communities to go above and beyond to get um, financial incentive discounts on flood insurance get rewarded 
for doing things like that on their own. So if they were to say, hey, based on these scenarios, and FEMA will provide non-regulatory products that say, here's what your community looks like for the 500-year flood, and here's how high the water will get, they could adopt that knowing that they suspect that sea level rise and precipitation is going to increase, they could adopt those and make those regulatory. While FEMA doesn't mandate it, it gives them the option to adopt a higher regulatory standard and increase resiliency and mitigation. Um, I thought you were gonna lob me a ball so I can knock it out of the park and say, yeah, we're all about mitigation, but the, the climate change thing was a curveball. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Other questions? Um, back to the warehouse issue. Um, there's a potential for those happening in Upper Mount Bethel Township in the Slate Belt. There's a recent purchase of a very large tract of land that's adjacent to the river, to the Delaware. What uh, can a local community do to, are there any uh, preventative things we can do in terms of zoning? or uh, working with some of your organizations to just anticipate things that are happening? I mean, reducing the size of buildings, what's permitted, um, how the areas of runoff, so on. Just in terms of zoning, for, for them. Mm. <laughs> So uh, land use law uh, is set at the local level in Pennsylvania. And then in areas like the Lehigh Valley, there's also a very strong component of involvement uh, by the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission, <coughs> represented by Mr. Schmiedebach. Um, generally speaking, by the time a piece of land has been purchased with a particular intended use, the purchaser has already made some kind of determination that the property that they've purchased is acceptable for the use they intend or has made an educated legal bet that whatever zoning or land use changes are required are legal battles that they can win. That's not always the case, but I, you know, in generally speaking, if somebody's gonna purchase a piece of land for a particular purpose, they've already been are reasonably assured that it will uh, it will be able to be used for that purpose. I think the most effective way for residents and concerned citizens to engage in their community is to learn everything that you possibly can about the zoning and land use regulations, both at the level locally and uh, from the Planning Commission, and there's resources in both places that can help you. I, I just recently was uh, had a conversation with a group of extremely concerned citizens where I live in Upper Bucks County who were incredibly opposed to a development that was gonna occur, uh, I thought was very good reason. And there was something like 25 or 27 people in this group who are all relatively well-educated and knowledgeable and not one of them had ever had read the zoning ordinance and they weren't familiar, and it turned out that nobody was actually willing to do that. So um, I can tell you that zoning ordinances are not particularly interesting, but really learning uh, about what's allowed in your community and where the wiggle room is and consulting uh, knowledgeable lawyers is really the best way to do it. Jeff, what do you think? Do you have anything you would add to that? I mean, you're really the best person in the room to answer that. for that warehouse, because that's the law. You have to provide for every conceivable use of land in the individual municipal zoning ordinance. So if you don't like one particular type of thing, whatever it is, you are bound by state law to provide for it somewhere. There is a loophole or a wrinkle though that allows communities to partner with other communities, which I know Upper Mount Bethel Township is doing right now, partnering with nine other municipalities because under that same state law, you can share all those land uses among 
the cooperating municipalities. So if there's two of you or 10 of you, you can decide that we want the warehouse to be there. And I'm not sure who's the one that's gonna say, yeah, we'll take that. But if it's provided somewhere within those communities that are planning together, then not everyone has to have that same use. So that's one of the ways that municipalities can deal with it. Uh, but then you also have just the zoning ordinance itself. Most people's zoning ordinances were written before warehouses were the thing. And so you'd have a lot of districts that it were defined that provided for some kind of general industrial use. Not really thinking that it meant that it would be some huge structure uh, just to hold goods temporarily that was gonna have trucks come to it and things like that. And so that wasn't really much of an issue a decade ago when many ordinances were written. And so a lot of these industrial type zones can probably have that kind of use because the code's not written tight enough if the interest is in regulating them to a higher degree. So there are things you can do. Um, there are some negative things associated with this. If, if it's an issue you're concerned about now at the municipality, property owners know that. And they know that if you're going to try and go through a zoning process to change what you currently have, they can protect their rights by submitting a plan. So if they want to have a warehouse eventually, they can submit a plan. And unless you've already moved through the process and adopted an amended ordinance, they can protect their rights under the current code. So there's a lot of those kinds of pitfalls to be aware of under Pennsylvania law, but if communities can plan together and work together, you can mitigate those impacts the best you possibly can. So no, I have nothing to add, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, Lehigh Valley Planning Commission is also um, part of, and, and Jeff are part of our advisory team. Um, so we're bringing together all the people that have, have this kind of knowledge to help our community. So thank you, Jeff. about what you were speaking about, but to me what I'm hearing is there wants to be some sort of development along a river, is that correct? It's worth checking if it's in a special flood hazard area. If it is, it brings up the question of will they be um, demolishing existing structures and building new ones? If not, if they're renovating existing structures, would it trigger something called substantial improvement? Where if they're doing the renovation, are the costs of that renovation greater than or equal to 50% of the fair market value of just that structure, not the land? If it is greater than or equal to 50% of the fair market value, it's treated like a new structure and therefore has to comply with the floodplain ordinance, which could entail dry flood proofing or elevating to get mechanical, electrical, um, and plumbing outside of um, areas where water would infiltrate. What about um, nothing specific with the floodplain ordinance likely. Uh, again, if you want to follow up with me and we can look at the flood map and see where it is afterward, we can talk in more detail. Yeah, so um, the project that you're looking, we're familiar with the project. We haven't seen the project yet. Um, it's still in its very early stages. Um, we haven't even had a pre-application meeting on it yet, but I, we have heard that it is out there. It will require that NPDES permit um, that will be reviewed by us. The NPDES permit requires that post-construction runoff be equivalent or better than uh, the pre-construction runoff. Uh, so in the situation of uh, a warehouse or whatever is going to happen there, the impervious surface that is installed needs, th something needs to be installed to counteract that. So uh, the rate, volume, and quality of that water cannot change based on this permit. So that is what the, what our permit uh, requires and what Rebecca is saying in my ear right now is a reminder to me that it is based on the two-year storm So the standard storm anything above that there could be implica Implications for the the uh, the water courses that it, it would discharge to um, But there is also factors into the stormwater management plan for higher storms as well so it will be looked at um, very strictly but it is one of our larger developments in the county that will be coming through us. So feel free to, to come and, and talk to my board at the board meetings um, and express your concerns as well. Um, they're, they're there to assist the citizens. All right, I'll take one last question. Do any of our students who haven't asked a question have any yet? Okay, Jaden, I'll let you close us out. And then remember, 
how committed are you guys willing to communicate um, flood mitigation plans and environmental restoration? Because I bet 75% of people in this area do not know any anything about this or more. None of our students had heard of Turn Around, Don't Drown, the National Weather Service's key slogan for keeping flood safe. Not any of the 14 of them had heard of Turn Around, Don't Drown. <laughs> so we know education and outreach has, a, there's a lot more to be done. And I know that this is probably built in, baked into all of your jobs. I've never heard it either. You've never heard it either? No, turn I Turn I Around, Don't sure. Drown? Has it's anybody ever I heard it? Turn Around. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well now you've all heard turn around, don't drown. If you're approaching a wet road, turn around, don't drown. That's the key slogan now of the National Weather Service these days. Um, but his question about education and getting this word out, out to the public, did you want to start there? We try very hard. Um, <laughs> we got standing room only uh, here. I mean, <laughs> it, it must not be working. <laughs> um, no, but we really do. And I, I would even say that they are trying to stay current with the times, right? So I was asked before I came here to get pictures so that they could tweet about this event tonight from FEMA Region 3. So I asked mm -hmm. you to take some pictures, which I hope we captured. So, so we could follow FEMA Region 3 yep. on your social media um, <laughs> so, so honestly, we have an en entire department called External Affairs where we focus directly on that. I know me on my day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm constantly working with local communities, providing general technical assistance and outreach. One of the big challenges at the local level especially that I've found in my three years with FEMA is um, there is tremendous amounts of turnaround. So I've been working with local floodplain managers in thousands of communities throughout FEMA Region 3 and I'll call them back or I'll email them and they're gone. So Sometimes it feels like we're running in a rat race because I spend, I travel a lot, as I said, right? And a lot of that is education and outreach. And I'll go and I'll train everyone up and then I'll find out that uh, they left. So I gotta go back and I gotta do it all over again. So that's one of the big challenges, um, but I can say that I think we're very committed. Um, I tend to be an optimistic person though and I feel like everyone <laughs> criticizes me for that at the office that I'm overly optimistic, but um, I, I think we're making progress and I can say it's high on the radar. We have an outreach and communication strategy that is of utmost importance to our uh, leadership at FEMA too. I, I mean, it's almost like a philosophical dilemma. Like, do we focus on all the people or do I focus on all the people I'm not reaching? <laughs> in which case, I'll be in a state of constant despair. Um, or do I focus on the fact that, you know, seven years ago, the Watershed Coalition uh, founded a citizen training program that has now, you know, trained over 1,200 Pennsylvania citizens to engage in their communities. Sharon and I and others in the room put on a watershed conference that reaches a couple hundred people in the Lehigh Valley. We go into high schools. We train people to work with elementary school students. I can only count the people I can't reach. I regret all the people I can't reach. But I'm in my 50s. I'm hoping to do this for another 30 years, and I don't want to need Prozac <laughs> <laughs> to do it. So I'm going to join with this gentleman in trying to just stay optimistic. <laughs> uh, the only thing I'll add is uh, I believe that the MS4 uh, permit program and the push um, on that program is going to be beneficial, um, especially for your generation as well. Um, one of the requirements of the municipalities, which of course they're not crazy about, is public education, public involvement, and training of their, of their staff members as well. So that's one thing that our organizations are assisting them with, is to make sure that they're trained so that they can have outreach programs and start to implement these and, and, and send out information to the citizens to kind of connect the dots. Um, so I think that the program is, once it actually does take off, um, we'll see the benefits of it. And I think education is gonna be one of the big ones. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our panelists um, for, let's give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. I know there are a lot more questions that you have and conveniently they're going to stay. Um, so we're all gonna move over into the other room. There this are tables just to no remind you. Um, Rebecca will be there with the table representing the um, Lehigh Valley Watershed Coalition and we'll, you'll have Master Watershed Steward. I do. 
yes, Master Watershed Steward Programs as well. And also we have in the room Randy Fay, who is here from Penn State Ag Extension, who is part of the Master Watershed Program as well. If you have questions about tree hazards, about um, spotted lantern fly, about agricultural issues, he's going to be your go-to guy there as well. Um, we have um, the uh, American... Uh, I can't wait ever say that. American Society of Civil Engineers, David Wheeler, thank you so much. Um, so if you have engineering related questions and civil engineering questions, and that's a lot of where the work for this, um, these kinds of projects that we're talking about are going on, um, he's there and you've got an infrastructure report card for the state of Pennsylvania at his table, which is really interesting. That'll tell you how well we're doing or not on various, oh, no, he's shaking his head, no, on various components. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have um, our representatives from Northampton County Emergency Management Services here. Your questions about um, hazard mitigation, about disaster recovery, about emergency response, about 911, um, and about hazard mitigation grants. Those are your guys um, over there, and so make sure that you go visit their table. Um, Tom Guth, Todd Weaver are here, um, and, and I'm not sure who else is still here. Um, Mike Rampula I saw, and I'm not sure who's remaining, but the, we've got a great team there. Um, and Sharon will have her table um, to follow up with her and Zane um, and, and Rebecca. So thank you, eat up some food, grab some food, go join them. Oh, we, we're going to distribute surveys. Um, and if you would take these, they're really quick. They're like check off little boxes with a little place to add some thoughts. You can fill them out after you have the presentation time and leave them on the table, or you can leave them here. Also, if you didn't sign in when you came at the desk, if you would, that would be very helpful to us. We know we uh, didn't capture everybody, so if you could sign in at the desk out in the hallway before we leave, that'd be great. Thank you, everybody.